with Studio Talk. I'm here, I'm Cheryl Duick, and this is... This is Daryl Duick. And we are here with, with three fabulous, or actually two fabulous guys um, that are <laughs> audio engineers. <laughs> and the first one is Christian Stonehouse. He's from Calgary, Alberta. Welcome, Great. Christian. Thank you. Great to oh. be here. Thanks for having me. And our, our other audio engineer is uh, Daryl Thisdale. He's from New Brunswick. Oh, there he goes. Yes. Yeah. And, oh. and joining us is Jeremy Trites, audio engineer all the way from Toronto. Welcome, Jeremy. So glad to see you. Hey, guys. Is that your boat, man? Uh, I'm on my boat. Heard <laughs> <laughs> the noise for one second. <laughs> nice. Uh. Good problem to have. <laughs> Taking advantage of the COVID while we can. So, yeah. well, while we, well, the reason why we're here, guys, is we want to talk about microphones. Jeremy, was that a microphone? That was not. That's actually a, uh, a heat gun. Ah, oh, there you go. <laughs> I was actually just finishing uh, wiring up my new stereo. So, oh, nice. okay. and that's for listening to your mixes before you send them out to get mastered, correct? See? No, no. That's right. There's no there's no room echoes to deal with when you're out in the middle of the lake. That's right. Well well, we want to have this conversation talking about microphones. Um, why don't you guys take time to share about your background and your knowledge um, just in what you do? Why don't we go from west to east? We'll start with Christian. All right. Well, um, I've been in music and audio for quite some time, probably since I was 17 on and off. Um, singer songwriter started out. I've worked uh, for jingle companies. Uh, I've worked in international music production houses. I've uh, worked for uh, been house studio for Randy Backman for many, many years out on Salt Spring Island. Um, so, and I've toured a lot and done a lot of church tech stuff. So I've been a tech director for many years on and off at lots of different churches. So yeah, I've been involved in music and sound more recently, getting back to my roots of writing and producing and singing and kind of all the stuff that I ended up doing for everybody else. I'm sort of coming back to that now. So a little bit more anyways. That's awesome. awesome. So let's go to Jeremy. Let's tell, uh, hear a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so did I hear something about New Brunswick before I just when I joined? Yes, you did. So I grew up, I actually grew up about 50% in Nova Scotia, 50% in New Brunswick. But I actually, when I very first started getting involved in audio was when I was living in New Brunswick. Uh, my dad's a retired pastor, and I kind of got roped into doing sound at church when I was about probably 12 or so. And so that's kind of where I got my start. Um, I'm a graduate of the Recording Arts Canada, uh, which was a good school once upon a time when there was still audio being taught and it wasn't just a video game design school. Um, but I think they're on to something because I think that's where the money's at now. Um, uh, lived in Halifax for a little while, worked at a few different uh, production houses there. I've been in Toronto for about almost 16 years now. Um, I was the technical director at the Prayer Palace here in Toronto for I think about four years, three or four years. Um, I was with Julie Black as tour manager in front of house engineer for five years. Uh, I was the senior engineer at the Rouge Valley studio for about three or four years. Uh, and in all that time, I've always just worked as a freelance engineer studio and live uh, under my own banner. I've had a few different smaller project studios that I've run on my own over the last 20 years. And that's how I know Jeremy, because he helped me with my first uh, CD. <laughs> <laughs> I, that kind of ages me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Daryl, all the way from New Brunswick. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? There, there we go. We can hear you now. Awesome. Yeah, I'm from Woodstock, New Brunswick, and I'm the owner of Art Stop Studios. I'm 67 years old. I got into music when I was 13 years old. And I've always been the type of guy that when I hear music in my head, which is all the time, I hear everything. So I hear a guy playing guitar, I hear a guy playing, playing the bass guitar, I hear a person playing pedal steel or organ or everything. So what I tended to do was I started to 
play multiple instruments. So I still play drums. I've been doing it for 52 years. And no, I'm nowhere near an expert. I play all different kinds of guitar. I'm very proud. I'm one of the very few pedal steel guitar players around. Uh, I play banjo. I play mandolin. Uh, I play some piano. Um, I'm starting to uh, learn the pan flute. Um, and I can't think of, there's probably stuff I play bass and all that stuff. So I tend to, when I come into my studio, I like to write my own stuff, record my own stuff, play everything. And so if it sounds good, well, then it's okay. And if it's not, I have nobody to blame for myself. So like I said, I'm 67. I wanted to re when I retired at 65, I decided I was going to open my studio to the public. And I took $10,000 and went and did that. The $10,000 has turned, just turned into, oh my God. And but my studio has been nothing but successful. When the time COVID was shutting everything down, I had three live CDs on the go. I had three uh, demo CDs on, the CDs on the go. And people are knocking at my door, please open up, please open up, please open up. And so uh, this is my world, and and I've loved music since I've been 13. And so I'm doing what I love. And I wanted to bring Atlantic Canada, some of the best equipment that they get their hands on. Because there's different studios in Toronto that have beautiful equipment of all this kind of gear. And down Atlantic Canada, not so much. So I wanted to offer people the best that I could offer them at really good rates so that everybody could walk into my studio. Really good. Really cool. So I think we're going to head off with a really tough question right off the bat. What is a microphone? <laughs> okay. That's the reason why this question pops up. The reason, because we were trying to decide this, like, what is a microphone? And I said, a microphone is a device that is being used to amplify a voice or to help it record. Am I wrong or am I right? As an end user, that's my understanding. So what, am I correct or am I incorrect? Well, um, talking into my microphone, it's an instrument that replicates what is being put into it. So if you've got a half decent microphone, it'll really do a good job. And if you don't have a really good microphone, it really won't do a good job. And one of the things that I mentioned before, the, the other, the other, I remember when all of us were all young and someone had a cheap tape recorder, somebody talked into it and they said, oh my God, I didn't know I sounded like that. And it's like, no, you don't sound like that because it's a cheap microphone and it's a cheap setup and it's a cheap system and you really don't sound like that. But a microphone is supposed to replicate what's put into it. Christian, Jeremy, how would you define a microphone? Uh, if, if you want to get really technical, the, I think the technical term one would use for microphone on the scientific end of it is transducer, which basically means what, what you got to understand, we all know, but to try to explain it just a little bit, sound is transmitted through air, and all sound is, is waves of air traveling through the air. And, and I, I'll make an ironic uh, analogy here, being that I'm on a sailboat, a microphone is not entirely unlike a sail in that it harnesses air to achieve its purpose. What a microphone does is it's, it's, it's essentially like a mini little sail that is, is held in suspension, in one method or another, uh, that the sound waves hit it and cause it to go, I should do this this way, the sound waves hit it and cause it to go forward backwards, picking up the vibration that's going through the air from the sound source, which then converts that, it, it converts that vibration of the diaphragm or the ribbon uh, into an electrical impulse, which is basically what's taking the sound wave going through the air and turning it into an actual electrical signal. That's, that's good on the technical end, absolutely. Um, getting into, you're probably going to ask about the different types of microphones and what they're used for, of which we will talk about. Um, and all of us probably have our own experiences of which 
um, by which condenser and dynamic and ribbon microphones have great placements. Um, I would say in recent years, what's interesting about the technology of a microphone is that like many different technical advances, it's become more of something that just works. And it's become something that generally speaking goes on in the background where we don't have to think about it as much. If you were around 60 years, you had to very much be aware of impedance mismatches and things that weren't properly ready to connect to a preamp. And there was always so many more elements to deal with. Now, you can have a really high quality microphone that you can pick up from Long and McQuaid, plug it into your USB port on your computer and your computer will walk you through how to use it. It doesn't say, are you an audio engineer? Are you sure you're capable of doing this? It just walks you through it. So I'd say now more than ever, what's exciting about that is it puts that technology in the hands of, of everyone. Uh, for There's danger to that, obviously. <laughs> but but uh, no, I mean, it, in the right hands and when we understand how to use it, a microphone can be a wonderful thing. It's amazing. That's awesome. So I did a little bit of research and I went online and I typed in, what is a microphone? And so it's spat out and microphone is an instrument for converting sound waves into electrical energy variations, which may then be amplified, transmitted or recorded. I just figured, you know, people thought, oh, it's funny what a microphone is, but actually knowing what the purpose of a microphone is, it helps, I think it helps with the selection and what you're going to do to record or to capture, I guess it would be the sound wave. So what are the type of microphones that are out there? We can go into the three or four main types of the cardioid or the, there's the polar pattern or there's the type of microphone, whether they're phantom powered or not. And I'll let you guys kind of delve into that. Uh, I'd like to delve into ribbon microphones. Okay. What is a ribbon microphone or what type is a ribbon microphone? Explain it, please. A ribbon microphone is a mic that uh, actually has a thin metal piece and it's, and it's a, a ribbon, very, 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 very thin, maybe an inch, two inches, depending on the manufacturer, how long they want to make it. And so as uh, our guy was uh, saying in the first, how the diaphragm goes back and forth. Well, the ribbon microphone is the same thing. It's a ribbon that when you talk into it, it takes the sound waves and moves back and forth. And the ribbon microphone at one point in time was a, a, a very popular microphone. And over time, people got away from it. And it's uh, a microphone that uh, people are starting to lean back to it's a very forgiving microphone, takes EQ very, very well. Uh, it's, it's um, how can I say it? It's a very smooth type microphone, the ribbon. It makes it very smooth. And if you get a really half decent a ribbon microphone, you also get built into like a proximity effect. And the proximity effect is uh, I, this microphone that I had sitting right here in front of me, uh, this microphone. I can have, uh, I can sing into it 10 feet away, no problem. And as I get closer to the microphone, my voice starts to get a little bit lower because it's the proximity effect. And so I get more chest, more bass, everything. And as I get away from it, uh, I get less and less, and I get more mid range, more kind of high end type thing. Uh, I own a few stereo pairs of, of uh, ribbon microphones, and I really, 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 really like them. And uh, this microphone here was made by West Dooley AEA. Uh, they only made 52 of these. I have a stereo pair of uh, 37, 38, and I covet these as much as a uh, demolisher's would covet gold. Okay. Christian or Jeremy, if you want to talk about some of the other types of microphones. Do you want to take dynamics or do you want to take condensers? Let's split it up. <laughs> I'll take dynamics. Okay, so uh, a condenser, 
One of, one of the things I will touch on with the ribbon microphone, and I, and I agree with what Daryl said about ribbon microphones, a couple other points to note about ribbons just to follow up. Um, ribbons tend to have a fairly, now this is generally speaking, uh, ribbons tend to have a fairly low output compared to uh, a dynamic and especially low compared to a condenser. So, uh, you know, the, the ribbon microphone does give you that mellow sort of smooth tone. Uh, the thing that people have to be aware of if they use a ribbon microphone is you got to have a good quality preamp that's very low noise because you generally uh, tend to have to crank the gain up more for a ribbon than you would for a, uh, a condenser. So if you've got a low quality preamp, is you start cranking the gain up, a lot of times you get noise that you don't want uh, on your track. So with the right preamp, uh, ribbon's a heck of a thing to have. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a product called the Cloud Lifter. I don't remember who makes it, but it's actually a product that's supposed to go between your ribbon mic and your preamp to just boost the signal um, to help. And it's a very clean boost of the signal to help with people that might not have such high gain preamps at their disposal. Uh, condenser microphones come sort of in two varieties, small and large diaphragm, generally speaking. Uh, small diaphragm mics tend to be uh, what we would a lot of times maybe take for uh, a dynamic because they're, they're sort of cylinder shaped uh, unit. Uh, large diaphragm condensers are generally a side address and it's what a lot of people refer to as a, a studio mic. Uh, the difference being generally speaking your large diaphragm is going to pick up uh, more low frequency than your small diaphragm. Uh, small diaphragm condensers are frequently called a pencil condenser just because of sort of the shape and size of them. They tend to be a very like a straight cylinder uh, front to back. Uh, much more pronounced high frequency clarity detail than a ribbon mic generally or than a dynamic generally speaking. Um, they require phantom power which basically every preamp made nowadays has. It's pretty rare to find one without uh, phantom power. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, they're mostly known for clarity, detail, high frequency. Um, that's, that's sort of the, the domain of, of, uh, of the, di of the condenser mics. Yeah. So when you say ribbon and condenser mic, which ones are find, found more in a studio setting? Are you saying the condenser mic would be found in a studio? Yeah, I mean, if you're talking about a commercial studio, you'll generally find a mix of all of the above. Uh, what Daryl was saying was true, though, that the ribbons over the last probably, I'd say, 20 years aren't as common uh, as, a, as a condenser or a dynamic. But generally speaking, as a, a, any real pro studio is going to have at least one or two ribbons. Um, yeah. The other thing about ribbons is the ribbon itself, and, and, and this, once again, I got to say this is in general, there are exceptions to this, but a high-end ribbon mic, generally the ribbon itself can actually be kind of fragile. So you have to be a little bit careful about what sources you use it on. You put it in front of a kick drum, there's a chance you're going to blow your ribbon in. So ribbons aren't generally used on as wide sources as dynamics or condensers. Um, so you're going to generally find more condensers and dynamics in a studio. Uh, but, you know, on the right source, a ribbon sometimes is the only way to go. Yeah. I think to add to that, I think uh, the one reason – so ribbons generally, and you, you touched on this, rib, ribbons can have a gentle high frequency roll off. Now what's, for anyone that doesn't understand what it is, but it's basically the equalization. So there's this idea sometimes that if, if the frequency realm is completely flat from bottom, from base, all the way to treble to the very top, that that makes things perfect. Unfortunately, some of the things that a microphone are recording don't actually have a, a super pleasant sound if your ear is within five feet from them. I'm going to give you an example and people out there might fight me on this one. So if you take a violin, if you stick your ear three feet from a violin where its sound hole is, you're generally not going to love the sound of it. Now, if you play violin, you're going to get used to that sound. And again, somebody might fight me on this. Um, but when you kind of come off axis from the violin a little bit and the further you move away, hence you get into uh, orchestration, like on a stage, generally speaking, the microphones that are recording a group of violins um, are usually 10, 12 feet away. And there's a reason for that. Some of that high frequency harshness kind of mellows out 
as you move away in, in, in the ambient room. So it is understanding the purpose. So um, when you, when you relate it to ribbons are used a lot as well on um, like brass instruments. Well, brass instruments can be a little bit edgy in the treble and in the upper mid range, it can bite a little bit and a ribbon mic will just actually naturally just mellow it out a little bit. Use the word mellow. Um, Daryl, and that's a great word for it. I absolutely love ribbons on certain things. So, um, but I don't want to, that was you guys talking ribbon and condensers are amazing. I have one here. This one here is uh, my Neumann TLM 193 that I, it's an old one. It's a little bit darker. So Daryl, you'll appreciate this. I always, always have to add top end EQ to this like quite a bit to get it to sparkle. And I love it because of that. That's all other conversation. But us guys, us guys that love gear, we, we actually sometimes want to be able to apply uh, some really high-end equalization and stuff like that to the microphone. Nowadays, many of the condenser mics that come out of the box already sound so crispy and top-endy that we can run it through a $10,000 preamp and equalizer and we can't do anything to it because other than... Be, there's nothing we can add to it because the chip is already built in to make it really sizzly and really high endy. Does that make sense? Or, the, or those words, Cheryl, have I not understanding yes. what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to keep this sort of simple. Okay. So <laughs> dynamic. Okay. Should I take a break now? Cause I didn't even talk about dynamic mics, but I've been talking a lot. Well, so. um, go ahead. Talk about dynamic mics. We haven't heard that yet. And, and you know, as I'm hearing you all speak, I've got, I've got my little picture of all the different mics that I've used in my lifetime. Mm. And I've seen everything from, you know, the little mics that hang in front of people when they're singing in a group to the handheld mics. And I'm, I'm in my head, I'm thinking, when, you, when I first heard ribbon mic, I thought, oh, that's the one that hangs from the ceiling, right? Oh, right. <laughs> you know? sure. And, I, sure. you know, and you know, I, I know that it does, I, I'm an end user. So when I hear all of this, I know it makes you laugh, but I, I, I'm talking from an end user point of view going, okay, that's a ribbon mic, must be that one that hangs. And then, you yeah. know, sure. And, and this one, hangs, this one is. So yeah. I love hearing about this because now I'm being educated. I now know a ribbon mic is more about what the, the functionality inside or how it's designed on the inside and how it moves the air or the waves and does the conversion. So, hey, I'm getting that's smarter. Right. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. No, it's true. I mean, some, yeah, for some of it, like I said, just happens in the background. They're making ribbon microphones to be a lot more powerful than they used to be as well. Like some of the newer production ones are running even off of phantom power and, and have a little more top end. And so it's, it's interesting what's happening in that regard. But again, uh, so we'll move on to dynamic microphones, dynamic microphones, generally speaking, their purpose um, they're used a lot in scenarios where there might be extraneous noises. So take a common stage when you're touring. Um, if you're wanting to pick up the toms of a drum kit, but you don't want to hear the guitar amp, which is really loud, 12 feet away, you wouldn't want to put a condenser mic over that tom because that condenser mic is so good at picking up everything that it literally is picking up everything around. And all the audio engineer in that scenario in a live setting just wants to hear that one tom. And, and even a ribbon mic uh, in that context is not going to really do the scenario justice because even though it might work, because a uh, ribbon mic picks up, generally speaking, in a figure eight pattern. So like this and then, so it picks up out the front and then it picks up in behind in equal level. So we get into real technical stuff, um, but if you were to put it over the tom, you're gonna pick up all the stuff above the tom because it's not just pick what you're pointing at, it's everything behind it. Does that make sense? That makes sense. <laughs> Whereas a, car, um, a condenser mic typically, like a large diaphragm, as uh, Jeremy was mentioning, it's picking up in a cardioid pattern in front, sort of, so that a nice really wide area in front, okay? Uh, side address is, was the conversation. You guys can look that up, front address or side address. Um, dynamic mics just are better at picking up stuff that's right in front. Uh, I won't even get into the technical uh, aspect of them. They generally require more gain than a condenser mic. They're generally going to have a little bit more um, 
they're not going to be as flat and as perfectly pristine as a condenser mic, generally speaking. Um, having said that, I believe, yes, this, would be, this is a dynamic mic here that I'm talking into. They have their purpose and they have their point. And this is just trying to pick up what's coming out of my mouth and really close to the source. So a dynamic mic is great for that. We use it on things like guitar amps. We use them on lots of stage instruments. There are people that use them in the studio as well, um, particularly in scenarios where you're trying to isolate from other members in the studio who are playing at the same time, if that makes sense. We could get into patterns. We can talk about that later. There's different patterns that different dynamic mics have, but I've talked for a long time now. <laughs> so a dynamic mic, so a dynamic mic picks up, is more directional in terms of what it picks up. Is that, is that kind of what kind of, am I understanding correctly? Whereas a condenser mic can picks up everything else and then tries to bring it all back in like. Yeah, yes. I mean, I might, Jeremy or Daryl can give the, the exact uh, technical term for it, but yes, there's, so like dynamic mic won't have as wide of a cardioid pattern. It typically is a little narrower. So, and cardioid is just the width, it kind of looks like a heart as it goes out. So if, if, the, if I had a card, if I had this mic, why don't I just demonstrate, let me just demonstrate, hang on. Let me take this off of here. Well, no, I'll just move it around. Okay, so if I was in front of this mic right here, so I'm talking in on, a, on with a, with a condenser mic like this, I could even be off to the side like this and it would pick me up in almost equal amount. Very much the same. And many really high-end condenser mics also have, this is a cool feature of them, will have like the, the high-end Neumanns will have, you can switch all different patterns. So one pattern that's available on really high-end microphones is what's called an Omni pattern. And Omni is literally picking up equal distance all around. So you could imagine if you had uh, a scenario where you had 12 people. And this is, the, the important part is your room has to sound kind of good. Um, otherwise, it doesn't work out well. <laughs> I, I think of Omni mics are usually now, I guess now we're going into the pickup patterns of mic pattern. Mic. Right. Right. So I would probably suggest an Omni mic is normally used on newscasters where they stick it on, on the tie so that you can hear them. That's usually where Omni mics are used in. And then you can get into some really interesting stuff with um, the really tight, pick up patterns with uh, the dishes that, that you see in the football fields, which is all picked up and surrounded by that. But usually yep. an Omni is to pick up a big group of people or what they'll stick on a newscast or something like that in the studio. That's right. And they'll also use them a lot in classical recordings. So that's one of the few places that Omnis get used quite a bit is on a stage with 72 players and they'll group them. Some, some engineers like to group them over instruments. I'm, I'm not a massive fan of Omnis myself. They're, they're okay. I, I find the room has to sound so good to use Omni mics. But do you have any opinion on that, on that Daryl or, or Jeremy? On your, do you ever use Omni mics? Um, occasionally. Uh, you know, it, what, what it comes down to really is just right tool for the right job. Um, there's not nearly as many jobs calling for an Omni as, as a cardioid or a figure eight or, or what else. Yeah. Uh, Omni mics, occasionally drum room mics. Sometimes, like you said, if you got like eight people gathered around one microphone, all singing together in a group. Uh, you know, sometimes use it in that in that uh, scenario. Um, but otherwise, you know, for recording, I can't really think of any other time I've used an Omni pattern. Mm -hmm. Really, other than than those those scenarios, really. And like you said, like the room. As soon as you switch into Omni, your room becomes ten times more important. Um, because you're, you're picking up way more of the room ambience than if you were in a cardioid pattern. That's right. Um, and I mean, while we're on it, we might as well talk about the rest of the, the, the polar patterns. Yep. Uh, I mean, sure. we, talked about, we talked about ribbons quite a bit, and I don't think there's an exception on this. Every ribbon I've ever seen is a figure eight pattern. Uh, I don't think it's possible really to make a ribbon without uh, a figure eight pattern. And what that basically means is if you're, you're – um, 
ribbons generally tend to be a side address. So if this is the ribbon mic, the sound from this side and the sound from this side are going to be the same. Uh, and that's what we call a figure eight pattern. So Actually, it, I'm going to ask, interrupt there. I'm from, I've read, I'm not an engineer, I don't have any ribbon microphones, but I, I've heard a number of times different sides of the ribbon mics have different sounds. I, I know that's, that is true. I have seen a couple ribbons that have a little bit more, um, I guess you could say presence on the front side of the ribbon, but all ribbons still pick up at least a, a almost the same front and back. Uh, sometimes you'll see it's, I guess, I don't know if you call it a modified figure eight, where there is a front, that has maybe 10%, 20% more, um, for lack of a better term, gain on the, on the front of, on the front end of the mic. But all, all ribbons are a figure eight pattern. Um, you know, as, as Christian was saying, there's a, a lot of the higher end, uh, large diaphragm condensers will have the switch to switch different polar patterns and they frequently have paradioid, figure eight and omni. Um, I don't, think you can do a figure eight with, a, with a, uh, a dynamic mic. I don't think that's possible. At least I haven't seen one. No. Uh, I don't think the, the, the physics, so to speak, allow for it. Uh, and then when you get into uh, dynamic mics and, and a lot of condensers, you're into a cardioid pattern and there's a couple of variations on the cardioid pattern. As Christian said, a cardioid kind of looks like a heart upside down um, facing forward. Um, then there's also hypercardioid and supercardioid which are basically just sort of narrower uh, on, a, on the sides of that heart. It's just kind of like squeezing the heart in a little bit yep. and making it a bit narrower to give you an even tighter. It's, it's kind of almost like taking a camera and just zooming in a bit. Yeah, great explanation. Definitely. Daryl, do you have any thoughts on the uh, polar patterns for microphones? So, yeah, I haven't used a lot of omni patterns myself. Uh, I think what we should talk about, which is very, very important, and everybody's touched on it for sure, and that's room. So, and room is everything. So if you put an omni microphone pattern in a room that hasn't been treated or doesn't have diffusion or doesn't have any of those things, well, you have, let's say you put 10 people around a microphone, you're going to have 10 people that everything they say is going to bounce all around the room and the omni pattern will pick up everything. Everything. So a cardioid type microphone, which is what they, they explained earlier, is in the front, kind of heart shape. And if you don't have a room that's really treated, you're better working with a cardioid microphone so that it will pick up just you and not so much of what's bouncing around a room. So if you spent the time and treated the room properly, you end up with, you can use anything, anything in the room. Uh, mm. You know, you have super cardioid, you get hypercardioid. You have so many now different polar patterns that you could use. Years ago, they had, you know, a few staple ones. That was it. And now manufacturers are offering everything to try and one up on the next manufacturer. So, and I think when you're using a microphone, uh, I think, which works in one studio may not work so well in another studio. So you have to spend time learning your room and learning your room is with a microphone and hearing what you're picking up and what you're not picking up and where if you position that microphone, you know, so the more cardioid patterns you have, on your microphone without room treatment and without knowledge is a recipe for disaster because if you don't really know what you're doing with the microphone uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> remember it picks up everything yep. yeah. and so if it's not done right it's going to pick it up and you're going to scratch your head why does 
you know, oh, I went from omni to cardioid to whatever, and it still don't sound no good. Well, you know, start off small. You know, start off with a cardioid microphone and then build. Uh, you know, my studio, I own 35 different microphones. And there's a reason for that. But you learn your craft. And then you can do something with all the patterns. But if, if you got all the patterns in the world, you don't know what to do with them. Yeah. You're not gaining a thing. Knowledge about all of this stuff is paramount. Mm -hmm. yes. and, and we've got some, I'm listening to the other panel, people on the panel, and yeah, I'm impressed. Great guys, great. I love what you're saying. <laughs> just for those who are just coming in and watching now, we are on Studio Talk right now, the Hub Online Studio Talk, talking with the three fabulous audio engineers and uh, studio owners. We're talking from all the way from Alberta, Christian Stonehouse. Uh, in Toronto, our very own Jeremy Trites, and all the way from New Brunswick, Daryl Fisdale. We're so glad that you are here <laughs> with us. Um, there are some questions that are coming in from the audience, if that's okay, if I can interject. Yes. Um, there is a question about USB microphones. Mm -hmm. uh, they would like to know from you three, what would you recommend for a USB microphone? A metal condenser recording microphone? for a laptop mic, uh, laptop Mac or Windows. Uh, studio recording vocals, voiceovers, stream broadcast. They just wanna know what your recommendations would be. Right, well, I think now more than ever, what's fascinating about this particular juncture in, junction in time is um, the, the ongoing need for a really good microphone that will connect up to um, people's existing equipment. So their existing devices and, and computers without the need for an audio engineering degree or like a, a need for a space like Daryl's down in the lower left there where you, he's obviously maintaining quite a bit of equipment as we can just tell from right behind you, Daryl, you, you're like, you're like four layers deep of uh, technology behind you there which is amazing and <laughs> sorry <laughs> no it, it's cool he knows how to use it um there's a lot of people who just have they just want to be able to set up one microphone in a decent room um now the warning with any of this stuff is that if you just set up a usb microphone they are making some really great ones now um audio technica to, to get right to the point uh, audio technica 2020 uh usb theirs is really great um, there's the blue, I think it's the USB, Spark. what's up? Blue Spark. Thank you, Blue Spark. There's a few really, really good ones out there right now. Um, USB, uh, there was, what was the other one I just recommended to somebody? Oh, uh, the, the Rode. There's a Rode NT, you know what I'm talking about? Let me see if I can look it up. I don't know what their USB is, but yeah, Rode has a lot of good entry level I'm looking it up. It is the NT USB. So, I mean, their, their stuff is really good as well. Um, those three are awesome. Um, a USB microphone takes a lot of the simplicity, uh, makes it a lot simpler for us, right? Um, but back to Daryl's point, you know, we're people like us are gonna encourage you, uh, if you're in a brand new house that's got vaulted 12 foot ceilings, I, I mean, the one, problem with today's contractors and today's marketplace is we love flat drywall so as consumers when we come into a place and we want we finally are ready to buy that place usually the people look around and go they don't want to see that old 70s stagnolite ceiling stuff so they want it flat now that's detrimental and that gets right to daryl's point it actually makes the room far more problematic so all you have to do is just listen to a few podcasts right now. I mean, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's like what I find hilarious is when the audio guys are podcasting about how to solve problems and everything and, and the audio, they're in the most echoey room and it's like, and they're talking about the technology of what, to, and I'm like, this is so backwards. This doesn't make any sense. Like, <laughs> because they kind of flip that switch off. Some of them, when they leave the studio, they flip that switch off. They go home and they got 15 foot vaulted ceilings and their dog's barking down the hallway. 
and everyone can hear everything that's going on. And it's like, maybe you could have picked a different mic for the job, you know, like, um, but anyways, there's some great USB microphones. I'll let you guys jump in, uh, Jeremy or Daryl, if you're aware of some other ones. Um, the only other one I can think of, um, who makes it? I'm, I, I'm, isn't there one that, because I think Blue makes a couple of them. I know the Spark, which I've used, is actually, a, 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 as far as USB mics go, pretty great. I think Blue makes another one, and I want to say it's called the Yeti. Yes. I might, yep, the yeah. Yeti is really popular right now. Yep. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big mic in the podcasting world. Um, the cool thing about Blue is, you know, uh, aside from making good sounding mics, they certainly have their aesthetics game on. You know, they make some very cool looking microphones, which probably doesn't hurt their their sales overall. Um, but I, I've I've told a few people over the years that looked at those and thought, oh well, it's just a, you know, it's probably just a gimmick or a toy because it looks kind of weird. It's like no, they actually uh, Blue makes some serious mics. I've got a Blue microphone. It's actually not a USB mic but they make a USB version of it. I've got the original blue microphone, which was the blue ball, right. uh, which I've had for years. And I'm pretty sure they make, I think it's the white one that's a USB mic. And I think they called it the snowball. Yeah, uh, they do. I think, which I don't know if they still make it or not, um, but it's actually, again, pretty solid USB mic. The thing to bear in mind about a USB mic is you're buying two things in one. You're buying a microphone and you're buying a preamp in one package because the preamp's built into the mic now. And actually you're buying a third thing. You're buying analog to digital conversion also yeah. in that case. So mm -hmm. you're kind of buying three products in one. Yeah. So, you know, is it going to be cheaper than buying uh, an audio interface, a mic, you know, most, most audio interfaces nowadays have a couple of preamps, uh, you know, built in. So is it cheaper than buying a microphone and a preamp separately or an interface with preamp separately? Maybe um, the the only and I'm not discouraging USB microphones, but just the thing to bear in mind is you've now sort of limited yourself with that purchase. If you're using a USB mic, that's that's what you got. If you buy an interface and there's a gazillion, you know, USB, FireWire, Thunderbolt, so many different brands of, of audio interfaces on the market now. If you buy an interface in a in a like a right for lack of a better term, a regular microphone, a non-USB microphone. If you get other microphones, you can try different microphones out with that same interface. Right. When you buy a USB mic, it's an all-in-one package. Um, but sometimes that is the right solution for the scenario. Um, so one question had to do with, um, I guess, pricing. Someone looked up Amazon.ca and found a price of a pre-owned Audio-Technica AT2020 condenser mic. Right. It comes in its original box. They want to know if this is a good deal. Well, we are we talking about the 2020 or the 2020 USB because those are two different mics. Yeah, that was. Uh, it's a 2020, so that's not a USB Probably. mic. It does touch on Jeremy's point, though. So a 2020, I used that to record a blues album many years ago, and it was funny. It's such a cheap microphone, right? It felt it felt wrong to record this singer with this mic. When I listen back to that recording from like 15 years ago, it still completely holds its own. I mean, that 2020 mic, I can't believe it's a hundred dollar mic because it, it, her voice sounds unbelievable to this day. And sometimes, and that's to, to your point, Jeremy, like, I mean, if you buy the 2020, you'll be able to upgrade your audio interface. You'll be able to upgrade your preamp and other things. And you still can bring that microphone with you. If you buy the 2020 USB, it's a one-trick pony. For me, a USB is entry level. There's nothing wrong with the USB, nothing. But it's like it's a one-trick pony. It gets you into recording. You don't have to have a lot of gear. Uh, how far can you go with it? Well, it depends on the demands you put on the microphone. You know, every microphone has something to give, and so. You can only ask what it has available. So the USB, well, it'll give you only so much, and that's about it. Do I have a USB microphone in my mic locker? No. Okay. Um, more more questions. Um, we have a producer that is actually tuned in. Welcome, Colin. Um, he asks, um, he says he has a favorite mic, which is a SM2 
7, 7 B. 7 B. So you'd like to have an option for male and female vocals. What would be a good step up? I represent Lewis in Canada. I am the Canadian distributor. Okay, a very good entry level microphone from Lewis is the LCT 440. It's a large diaphragm microphone and the small diaphragm and large diaphragm were explained earlier on how they work. And, and for a couple of hundred dollars, you get a quality, quality microphone that anybody that tries it is very impressed with. So I would recommend Lewis. And if you look in the background, you might see some boxes of Lewis audio microphones sitting on different strategic places in my studio. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because we forgot to mention the very, very beginning that there is a special offer that is being made um, for all our viewers in Canada. Um, that is as compliments of Daryl, um, who is a Lewitt uh, Canadian distributor for Lewitt. So you will tell you a little bit more about that in a few more minutes. Um, but let's hear from Jeremy and Christian on their recommendations or answer to this question. Um, what would you recommend as a good step up for male, female uh, vocal microphones in a studio? Um, I, I guess the way I would answer that question is I wouldn't necessarily think of looking at a mic as a quote unquote step up. Uh, what I would think of as think of your mic collection as sort of your paint palette and let's look at a, a different color to add to the palette. You know, there's uh, Daryl's heard, Daryl Duix heard, heard me tell this story. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Audio guys are a very opinionated bunch. And there's an <laughs> audio, uh, audio Not at all. Yeah, not yeah. at all. There's, yeah. there's an audio user form online that I read a lot, and I once saw a 12-page argument uh, among, you know, amongst a bunch of audio experts online about what's the proper mic used for recording vocals in a studio. And the second last message after 18 pages of argument that anybody uh, posted was, everybody knows you have to use a large diaphragm condenser microphone for vocals in the studio that's a serious professional has ever used a dynamic microphone on the lead vocal recording on an album and the last message that came right after that that shut the whole argument down was the guy that just popped in and said well they used an sm7b for the vocals on thriller i think that sold a couple units yeah. <laughs> which, which then nobody else wanted to try any other opinions after that so I don't, you know, the SM7B, look, they recorded the, vo the all the vocals on Thriller with it. So a step up, I don't, you know, I like to think of it as another color on the palette. And so if you've got a large diaphragm uh, dynamic, I would probably be looking at a large diaphragm condenser or potentially a ribbon as your sort of a second mic. You know, sometimes you're going to be in a situation where the vocals you're recording, seven, the 7B is the guy, it's, it's, you're going to try it out and it's going to beat the condenser. Or the ribbon so i would look at you know depending on your budget i would look at another um another mic uh let's say a large diaphragm condenser or maybe a, a ribbon mic as as another option another paper to go to yeah christian your opinion on that what should they do or where should they go right uh great comments you guys um yeah the 7b is is a classic microphone first of all um it works amazingly on a lot of people it doesn't work on everybody so there's people that have had their experience with their own and that comes back to let's go back to this whole conversation of the source the person singing into it some people have a natural resonance around 800 hertz when they sing and generally a female is going to resonate more between 500 hertz and 1.2 or something like that than than a male voice will so depending on what microphone you're using, it's going to either dip some of those resonances or enhance them. And that's what's fascinating is sometimes when you pair the right voice with the, the right mic, it'll just be magic. Right away you'll go, oh yeah, that sounds so good on my voice. Um, th there's an interesting uh, piece out there now. I'm going to try and share my screen here. Uh, let's do this. 
Um, this is by Slate Digital. It's getting a lot of guys are talking about it online right now. As a real, I have not used this, but I can tell you that a lot of people that I'm reading about have. It's very fascinating. It's about 800 bucks US, and it basically models um, a whole bunch of other microphones. Uh, where are they? Uh, hang on, the mics. So it's it's doing models of all these old classic vintage microphones, which for some people, if they know how to use the models, as Daryl was saying, um, then that's great. It, it, otherwise, it might just be another option that makes you go crazy because you don't know which one to select, right? Yeah. So I love I, using the analogy. I love using the analogy of the cereal aisle. How back in the seventies, there used to be twelve cereals to pick from, and now we're in the cereal aisle for fifteen minutes. And and because 12, there's twelve variations of Cheerios, right? Yeah. Because we're told that having that choice makes it better. So yeah, you know, same with microphones. Okay, so I'm gonna lump yep. a couple of the uh, questions here together because they're asking, well, if I have this type of voice, yeah, how do I choose a microphone? So if you, you could just look at, I won't say any of the extremes, but it's like you have a girl's voice versus a guy's voice or a shrilly voice versus a warm voice. Or the soft jazz, jazz. voice. Smooth. Well, that's a, yeah. Or the strong strident voice. So, so it's like, what would you use? And yeah, to me, it's just, it's, it's just an audition process. Yeah. And I mean, it, and it depends on what we're talking about here. If we're talking about like, we're in the studio and I've got a singer and I'm trying to decide what mic to use. It's an audition process. I'll set up, and I'll listen to them. Like just listening to the person sing, you're gonna get a rough idea. You're gonna know some mics that are definitely not gonna work, and some that you're pretty sure will be good. And then you just kind of maybe do two or three or four mics, do a quick audition, and you, and you go with what what sounds best in the moment. Now, if we're talking about, because I, I want to make sure we get the question right, if we're talking about if this is maybe a singer who's asking the question, saying, "I need to buy a microphone. How do I know what microphone to buy?" That would be the question. This is one place where the internet uh, just don't win. I'm sorry, but brick and mortar stores win out here. You need to go to, you know, a reputable and a reasonably well-stocked, you know, pro audio or music store. And you, you got to audition. You got to, you know, it, it's really going to depend on what your options are for your local supplier and, and what your relationship is with them. You know, there's, there's, I, I like myself, I can't right now, I don't think, because the apocalypse is on us, but generally in normal times, I, I can go down to Long McQuaid on Bloor, and I have a good relationship with the guys in Pro Audio there, and I can talk to them, and I can, and I can take, you know, I, I'm essentially doing a rental, but I can, you know, ask them about a mic, and I can rent it from them for a week and try it out. And that's, I, I just don't know of any better way to choose a mic than to try it. And if, you know, if, if I was a singer and I had the ability to go somewhere like that, and it's a matter of spending 20, 30 bucks to rent three or four mics for a weekend to try them all out, that's money well spent. And Carol, what's your thought on somebody who wants to buy a microphone for themselves? What would they need to do to choose a, a good microphone? Okay, so every voice is totally unique totally unique there's things in your voice that really you don't even really hear what's going on and so going into like a long and McQuaid's on blur uh which i spent many many times in there every voice is so unique and yep. there's not a swiss army knife of microphones get that right out of your head right away there's no Swiss Army knife. So that's why I own 35 microphones. Abbey Road Studios, uh, I think their mic locker is about 2,000. And there's a reason for that. Every voice is unique. So you got to go into like a long and McQuaid and try them. And I used to do the same thing with amplifiers and guitars at Long and McQuaid. I'd go in, spend a week with it. See, see what you feel. You know, do you feel this is great? Do you hear this is great? Can you hear the differences? If you're going to make a purchase and you got to be happy, you got to invest in it. 
investment of money, investment of knowledge. You know, if all us three panel members said, okay, go out and buy that microphone. What did you learn? Absolutely nothing. It's the learning process. So you just can't say, what's the best microphone for me? Okay, then I'll, let me ask this question and I'll, I'll keep you online here, Daryl. Um, if they're listening or they're going to go and buy a microphone, what are they listening for to know if it's a good microphone fit for their voice? Well, if I pick up a microphone and start singing into it and I don't like the sound, guess what? Wrong mic. Oh, I want to hear another mic that's better for me. Okay, let's try a Sennhauser. Okay, we try a Sennhauser. And he picks it up and goes, no, I really don't know. I really don't like the way it's reproducing my voice. And then all of a sudden they pick up me. I'll go back to a Lewis. And a lot of the times, and people should be ready to understand that just because you spent $5,000 on a microphone, that's going to make everybody sound like a princess. It's not going to do that. So it ends up where depending on, I can put a $5,000 microphone on somebody, and then I can take a microphone that's 450, and it goes, oh, that sounds a lot better. So you've got to go through the process of learning which microphone is best for you. Like it's a time invested, but nobody wants to invest in that time anymore. Everybody mm. wants to just ask the question, which is the best mic for me? Yeah, I think that's, you know, to add to what you're saying, I think that's what's kind of powerful about some of the new modeling technology is it does give people the ability to just be able to sample different models of these mics that are done really, really well. Like Slate Digital Technologies are one of the best out in the world at doing it. So um, not to take away from what Daryl's saying, because I don't think there will ever be a replication for actually having a different microphone for the job. There won't. But to have a tool that at least gives us some slight tonal variations all in one microphone is pretty powerful uh, technology that's coming out now. So, What is a vocalist looking for to make their voice sound good in a microphone? What, like how, like if you have a smoky voice person, do you get a bright microphone? Do you get a bright microphone or a, a, a dark microphone? That's good. That's a good point. I mean, it does come back to this room thing as well. Like, because if we're putting the power of the technology in the hands of the artist now, we're removing the, the, the people that used to be the, the uh, you know what I'm saying? The people that used to stand at the gates and make sure that everything was technically good. So it's it is really difficult to just sort of say you got to use this style i mean if if we told you to use to daryl's uh love of ribbon mics on the right singer a ribbon mic is awesome like it really is on the right singer in a good room and daryl's nodding his head because it has to be a good room because you've got figure eight picking up most back to my conversation of most people's dining rooms nowadays with drywall everywhere you're not going to put a figure eight microphone. And this is back to this cardioid thing. A lot of times the cardioid mics people are using on their podcasts and stuff. You know, we don't have to look much further than a radio station. Like if anyone ever wants to know, boy, how did they get that sound? And why don't they just Google like what a radio station has to do to get it to sound like it does. They've been doing it for decades. They've got, They've got the foam treated on the walls. They've got acoustic dampening. They've got, but again, like it, as was touched on, it takes an investment. It's, you're not going to solve all your problems by getting a USB microphone, sitting on your dining room table and being four feet away and singing your heart out. There is no microphone that's going to make it, your voice sound exactly correct. Cause you're going to be hearing the reflections of your dining room and the, and you're going to think you're going to keep going back to long and McQuaid 20 times because you're going to go, it doesn't, something's not right. So there's, there's more than one answer. Like there's so there's complexities to this, if that makes sense. Yes, there is. Jeremy. Two, two things I would touch on with this. Number one, 
the real simplistic answer here um, to one of the earlier questions was, and, and I've actually told people this, they say, how do I know when I get the right microphone? I told somebody once, bring a mirror. When you see yourself smiling while you sing, that's the right one. Um, and, and what that comes down to, you know, and, and just to kind of touch on that last question, you mentioned this idea of, well, if I have sort of a, sort of a, a thick, smoky voice, do I go with a brighter microphone and whatnot? Well, that depends. Do you want your voice to sound thick and smoky? You know, you, your voice is what it is. and You're not going to be able to drastically change it. But if there's characteristics of your voice that you really like and you want to accentuate them, or maybe you want to downplay them, you know, choosing my entirely different than choosing your outfit, you know? Uh, you know, you're gonna wear vertical stripes to make yourself look taller because you want to look taller. Or you're gonna, you know, like it's, 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 it's really not that different. It, it, it's, if you, I mean, let's hope you like the way your voice sounds, but the characteristics of your voice that you like you know, like I say, if, if you've got a gritty voice, you want a microphone that picks up that grit. If you are maybe have some harshness in your upper mid, now Christian mentioned this, you know, there's a lot of voices that have a, a harshness in that upper mid range, you know. Uh, and I can tell you from years of experience, Julie Black, that girl has got a horrendous harshness uh, around the two to three K range when she gets loud. And, you know, some of that is mic selection. A lot of that is, is EQ and dynamic EQ to try to smooth it. But... You know, even the best singers out there have certain characteristics to their voice that they might want to be trying to mask. And, you know, I never saw Julie smile as big as when somebody threw a ribbon in front of her because it smoothed out it smoothed out some certain problems. So it's, you know, sometimes you're choosing a mic to try to mask some things that you don't like. Sometimes you're try choosing a mic to try to accentuate things you really like. Um, so, like, it, it just, I know this really just adds even more complexity to the, to the answer. But it's, it's, there's no formula. I guess that's the way, you know, it's like saying, how do I write a good song? There's no formula. It's, it's, it's really a matter of trial and error. You know what? Um, I think one thing I'm learning is that I like, I like Daryl's um, analogy of the Swiss Army knife. <laughs> you know, no microphone is a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> Well, you know, but a Swiss Army knife has more than one blade on it. Which you're, what 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 Daryl's got is a mic locker that's a Swiss Army knife because he's got <laughs> blades on it. True. Very true. Yeah. Well, you know what? We are we are a little bit out of time. Well, actually, we're we're six minutes over our time. I want to say very much a thank you um, to all of you for um, taking your time to share your your knowledge. I also don't want to make light of this. Um, I did mention earlier about a few minutes ago that there was a special offer being um, being made to us. When we were in conversation with Daryl, he did say earlier that he is the distributor for Lewitt Microphones. And he did talk to Lewitt and Lewitt is offering between no, now, I'm uh, sorry. Archtop Studios. Archtop Studios, I'm sorry. Archtop Studios is now um, offering a 20% discount for anyone who wants to order Lewitt microphones. He is the Canadian distributor. Um, there is a code that you will need. So if you want that code, you need to go to our website, which is gospelmusicindustryhub.com. And uh, you'll see a pop up there to sign up to get your code. Those are for people who are not already on our mailing list. But if you are on our mailing list, please send an email to info at gospelmusicindustryhub.com. And we'll be happy to get that code to you so that when you place your order for, uh, for a microphone of Lewitt specifically, um, we can send that to Daryl and he will process that order for you. So Daryl, I want to thank you for offering that. Thank you very much. I should I say for asking me to come on this, I, I, this has been a learning experience for me also because the day that i say i know everything about microphones is the day when you have to kick me out of my studio <laughs> <laughs> so the other panel members gave a twist to everything and and it was so informative you know i'd like to do this again and <laughs> get on because there's so much more that we can offer an information. And that's right. And that's why we do this. We do this because there's a, I believe we have a treasure. Like you three men have treasure of information, golden nuggets of information about microphones, something that other people and users like myself may have originally taken for granted. It's like, give me that 
thing so that my voice can be amplified. But you, you have all explained why that thing is so important. And, and that, that thing is not just a one-stop shop deal. It is, it is something that um, is specially designed and, and there are so many versions of it that can, can really help us sound good. So, you know, I always used to say, like, um, you know, when people commented me and said, oh, you sounded so good today. I said, well, you got to thank the sound engineer because they made me sound good, <laughs> you know, kind of idea. You know, so, so I thank you all very, very much for being on this, uh, on the Hub Online, sharing your wisdom. Everybody uh, who's been watching, I hope you learned a lot from these guys. Um, we are going to rebroadcast this on YouTube and we will put their contact information or their websites on there for you so that you can look at them and look and, and I believe they have contact information that you can reach out to them and ask any questions. Um, our YouTube channel is GMI Hub TV. So that's you, our YouTube channel, GMI Hub TV. You will look for that video on there. Um, other than that, anything else? That is it. Okay. And don't forget to send us in for the uh, Lewitt microphones to get your uh, special code. Yes. And um, if you go to YouTube, we want you to like and subscribe. Also, we also want you to come back next week because next week we have got three fabulous rappers that are going to be on our show that is going to they're going to talk about songwriting but in terms of rhythm and lyrics and what better people to do it than people who literally rap right <laughs> like they do lyrics and music. so we want you to come back and watch that but for now we want to say thank you for joining us and we will see you again next week